leaders or potential leaders, influencers, the urgent quest for leadership uh, speaks about a perceived need for leadership and influence in our society. And I want to discuss that in light of the book we wrote uh, on ethics and bring the field, the academic field of ethics in discussion with the academic field of leadership studies, which is also an academic field of social studies and management. What I hope to do is with you tonight is have a small discussion after the introduction, what, how do we understand leadership, Christ and leadership, and then we come after the Christ and leadership, which is kind of a theological foundation of what we will do, biblical theological foundation. We come to the matrix model, which is a very typical model I present for moral reasoning or ethical reflection. I explain that to you broadly, if you want to know more, you have to read the book, and try to relate that to uh, leadership. And that's our four steps. We take principle, consequential, virtue, value, ethics, and then we come to a conclusion, actually also a time for questioning and discussions. I was a little uh, surprised and interested by this slogan of this university. Why not change the world? Uh, I like it because it's a question. If it was not a question, I don't think I would like it. I think it would be a little over the top for me. Um, and why not change the world? Maybe some people will say, we ha I don't have to change it. I'm happy with it as it is. And others will perceive a deep need. Now the perception of a need and to the drive to create a change is very typical for leadership. Most leadership starts from there. The, not that people want to lead, but they're unhappy about something and they want to create some change. That's a very, very strong drive that brings us in leadership positions. I also read in this about this university that it is a university where there is this mission in the call for raising up God's leaders for ages to come, which is also talking about leadership. The mission of the university I'm teaching and, and leading is, as a theological school, is this. We equip leaders to be biblically grounded, well-educated, and culturally enriched, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to our world. That's our mission statement. There you see that it's also about leadership, about influencing, with three core values. Biblical foundation, highly trained, university level, and culturally or cross-culturally enriched. Very similar to what you're doing here. Very similar. Um, now what is leadership? What is leadership? That is, um, it's very important that thousands of definitions on leadership but one key definition is that it is always about influencing, influencing people. Without influencing, you're not leading. And you need followers. There must be a group. You, you're not leading when there are no followers. Makes sense, isn't it? And you want to achieve a goal. Uh, for instance, my wife is a strong influence because she's a person people and she loves people, but she has no goal in mind. So that's, that's why I don't think she's a leader. She just is kind to people, caring for them, but not leading them to a certain direction. Um, even she doesn't like it, but she feels that other people are leading somebody else to a certain goal. So, goal achievement, creating a vision, creating change, motivation and growth are important elements of leadership. And you find them in many definitions. There is an overlap with management. And a very important overlap. Some people make a clear distinction. I think we have to be careful with that distinction. 
because the overlap is also quite important. With management, it is much more with creating order, stability, planning, organizing, staffing, and controlling. Without that, you cannot lead well. So they need each other, and leaders have to be good managers, and managers are also leading. There is an important overlap in everything you do. You have people with big visions and dreams, but it stays to their visions and dreams. Nothing happens. So management is essential. In leadership, we have the, the question, what is good leadership? I think that is one of the main questions today. How do we define poor leadership and good leadership? Poor leadership and good leadership is, has to do with effectiveness, with do we increase wealth, do we achieve common goals, but is it also a moral uh, understanding of leadership? John Stott, a famous evangelical leader, wrote this interesting book with other people, Issues Facing Christians Today. And I like the book very much because it deals with very important global issues like um, uh, unemployment, social justice, uh, racism, abortion, euthanasia, several issues are discussed. But the last chapter in the book is a, a very interesting chapter on leadership. And rightfully so, because you can have a view on the world and try to make a difference, but if you don't have leadership, nothing will happen. And that last chapter actually is a very good appeal for Christians leading in the public domain. And Christians leading in the public domain will use Christian principles in this public domain. But how do we do that? And is this possible? Um, so there is a call to do it, but there's not really a study how to do it. One of the reasons that we established in Brussels and Leuven the Institute of Leadership and Ethics was that we felt that there is a need for a deeper thinking about leadership from an ethical and theological perspective that the church was not doing. And a lot of literature is about church leadership, uh, which is good. Um, but and a lot of, there's a lot of literature about leadership and management that's not Christian. What we try to do is to bring three components together. It's leadership studies, the ethics and theology, I call them one component, and the third, social justice, sustainable development, uh, as kind of the other side of what leadership has to do, as a goal. Often you see in leadership studies that they're not talking about the goal. It's just the goal is to be excellent in your company, or you have a, a high productivity, or f efficiency. But I think they have to come together. What are your goals? What are you trying to do? And that's why we try to combine those elements and look into them, not only academically, but also from a Christian perspective. Um, which is not easy sometimes. Now we have a lot of interesting classical texts on leadership and when we go to philosophy it's um, interesting that the um, uh, philosophy since Socrates has a high interest in leadership. Actually the story of Socrates is one of a conflict with leadership. Leadership of Athens. And Plato's text the Republic is also very relevant for thinking about leadership training and education. It's a team in this work. The same for Aristotle's ethic, ethics. Their the ethic Nicomachea is a book actually somehow on leadership ethics. Because if you have, want to have some skills, uh, you need skills, virtues, uh, to achieve something. And he asked the question, what type of skills do you need when you want to lead a people, or a city, or as a general? And you find that all of that in Aristotle's work. In Confucius' Analecta, you have also leadership principles there. So there's, a, there's an enormous resource on classical text on leadership. I'm very happy with a new academic journal that is called Humanities and Leadership. It's very new, it just started. 
but finally they have it. So it's it's on the level of the Harvard Business Review. It's on an A level. It's a top level journal on humanities and leadership studies. And actually, you can use those texts. Uh, if a, for many people they will add the Bible here to that as another text uh, or the Quran. I keep it separately for other reasons. Uh, for it's not only about classical text of Bible, it's authoritative in many ways. Second are the social sciences, empirical research through field experience and surveys. That's the social psychology. There we find a lot on how a group functions, how a leader creates a group, but more, moreover, and I think more important, is how a group creates its leaders. So the group creates the leader. It's not the leader that creates the group. That type of social science studies are very relevant. And the Bible is a, a book that speaks extensively on leadership in Old Testament and New Testament. Of course, when we approach the Bible and look into the many texts on leadership and try to define an ethics of leadership, it probably won't work. Some did that before. Uh, even the selection of your text is complex. And the salvation history going through phases and the cultures are so different. I mean, how can you use leadership principles in a social system of the ancient Middle East, which was patriarchal, which was pre, uh, which nomadic in many ways, and had a very different style of social relationships than our structures we have. So we have to be very careful with just picking and choosing texts. We need deeper theological reflection to deal with the different and the variation of biblical text. Um, but before we do that, there's one big enemy, I think, in the whole debate. And that is that there is a duality often seen between our personal faith, our spirituality, and our workplace ethics and leadership. That they are two separate entities. And we find it all over. I find it in the church in many ways. That Christians say, okay, this is something that has to do with my personal faith, but once it gets to business, it's business as usual. It's leadership as usual. People that become very authoritative or use certain leadership structures that are not really Christian uh, or not reflected on and often very naive. It's very interesting that sometimes you have very competent people in their field, but when it comes to Christian reflection on what they're doing, they become very shallow, very naive, uh, and they don't relate. This is very old. This is also the, the Gnostic spirituality, which always comes back again and again, that the spiritual life and theology and Bible is something about heaven, it's something about a truth that is not real for the, our daily lives. So we have to bring our faith to the reality of our life. And to do that, um, uh, is the one group will focus on measurable facts, and the other group will kind of, we hope that we don't see and speak in the air, as if it's very, it, it's about faith. We hope and we don't see. Now how do we find a balance between those two that's also real in daily life? This is uh, the institute, what the, our institute does, Institute of Leadership and Ethics. Um, I skipped that. This is more important for me. The reality of Christ. I'm very much influenced by the theology of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And I did a lot of work on Bonhoeffer and uh, studied him intensively. And I have students still working on Bonhoeffer. Now, Bonhoeffer, as a theologian, German theologian, especially his ethics, that is, he never finished his ethics, but his work on ethics that is not finished, but yet very good as it is, and not well structured, but very good, is very helpful when we come to this area, to this field, when we define good leadership. For Bonhoeffer, he reacts strongly against any form of dualism that disconnects ethics and spirituality from the real world. Why do you think he is so 
strongly reacting against this type of dualism between spiritual world, Christian living ethics, and the real world of leadership and politics. Why is this a big enemy for him to disconnect those two? When did he live? He take born over. Yeah, in? In Nazi Germany. What was happening in Nazi, National Socialist Nazi Germany for many Christians? Persecuted. Persecuted. Yeah, they were not really persecuted. No. They were good Germans. And if you're good German, you just start your classes with Heil Hitler and life goes on as usual. What they did is they disconnected their personal faith their faith in Christ from the political realities they were living in. They, and that goes back to Luther's two kingdom theory, a certain interpretation of this, where actually what the state does and politics, it's not our business, it's state issue. And the church has its own issues. And once you disconnect those two, you give a lot of room to the dangers of idolatry, I would say political idolatry, but oppression of other people, persecution of other people, in this case, also even the Holocaust. So, Hitler didn't consider the church to be a big enemy because the church was doing its own thing. And that's why, also Barth in a certain way, Bonhoeffer was so much focused on the one reality thing. Now the Christians that were taking a confession against the German church, the German Empire and the German Christendom, that's Deutsche Christendom, which was a form of being National Socialist and Christian, they wrote the Barmer Declaration. Now how does the Barmer Declaration start? With declaring one faith in Christ. That starts with the classical creed that there's only one Lord, and that is Christ. Now, the moment a Christian says, and that's Bonhoeffer, there is only one Lord, you have destroyed every form of duality. That's the consequence. Because there is only one Christ. And which means that there is not something like a separate spiritual world. When you read another book of Bonhoeff that is more famous, I mean, you have to read that one on discipleship, the first chapters, Bonhoeff will discuss the Reformation, and especially what he likes about the Reformation is the, the end of the monasteries, destroying the monastic life. He says Luther needed a lot of faith first to become a monk, but he needed even more faith to leave the monastery. <laughs> it's about salvation through faith. But the end of the monasteries was actually the end of a dualistic ethics. That's what he says. Like there is an ethics for the monk, and there is an ethics of the normal common people. Luther and the Reformation uh, made an end of this Catholic dual system of dual ethics. Actually, we are all monks and priests now, also on the workplace. And that is a big change in our marriage, in our families. That was the Reformation. So the, the one reality is very important uh, for Bonhoeffer. And he speaks extensively about this, not so much in his discipleship, but in his ethics, especially the first chapters, but it comes again and again. He says that our faith is embedded in the reality of God to Creator, Reconciler, and Redeemer, and there's only one, there's only one reality, and that is Christ reality. Christus Wirklichkeit. Christ reality. Which means that I have no direct connection to any person than through Christ. Think about it. I cannot have any relationship between me and Professor Choi or Christ is in between us. And now you say well, you're both Christians. Yes, but even with non-Christians, Christ is between us as the reconciler. He's always there. 
in that one reality I'm living. And this is a higher Christology, Bonhoeffer speaks about the Chalcedonian Christology, than what would Jesus do Christology. What would Jesus do? What you find in some evangelical books like Time Management According to Jesus. That's stupid. That's ridiculous. You don't do... I mean, Jesus didn't apply time management as we used to do. But living in the Christ reality is something else. That's a higher Christology. Because in Christ, human nature and divine nature are unified. And it's the Christ of the book of Colossians. Especially, Bonhoeffer liked it very much, in Colossians to see he's above all the leaders of the earth. He is above everything. He's a sovereign Lord. This sovereign Christ that brings creational reality with, let's say, the reality of the business world, with the reality of the God the Father, brings that together. That's the reality we live in. And from that perspective, we have to go to leadership status with Christ as the mediator. Of course, Christ gave some key principles in his teaching too. But that is, I mean, once we get this Christ reality, we come also to his teaching. What was very typical. And you know this text in Matthew 20. A very interesting text because it's about leadership. And in this text, he compares his people that were looking for, his disciples where they were looking for position, with the world. And he says, with you it is different. You cannot exercise authority like the worldly leaders do, but you must be a servant, a slave, like I am. You, have, you need this mentality of a slave and a servant. Servant leadership. The question we may ask, is this a church model? Certainly. But now, back to my Christ reality and kingdom ethics. I cannot just say it's only a church model. The church has to be and should be an example in this. But it has to reflect on how we operate as Christians in the public domain. Because I live in one reality and I have only one Lord. And every type of dualism scares me away as something that brings me to idolatry in the end. Now, how to do that, that's a hard question. But the theological foundation must be clear there. That we don't use kind of a dualistic model, but that even these words of Jesus are announcing the kingdom of God, and the church should be a demonstration of that. Unfortunately, it's often not. It's very sad. But our type of leadership must be different. We have a leadership theory, the model of Greenleaf servant leadership. I'm quite critical about that because I don't think Jesus is giving us a model how to lead. It's more um, a, a kind of general statement in the different forms of leadership and styles and circles we have to operate. So it can be, this will be applied differently in a setting in the army than for instance in, in your youth group. But in an army you have to be differently. So leadership theory is much more complex than that and say just be a servant. We need this goal achievement and other elements of leadership. We have to be very realistic, but in what we do this servant attitude, this slave attitude, should be relevant there, even if we become an emperor. How do we get to good leadership? Is there a moral component in a leadership? I think there is, although there is a lot of discussion on that. Some leadership theories will disconnect the ethical part from the leadership theory, Others even put the moral component in the center. It's called the Hitler discussion. Uh, the Hitler discussion is, was Hitler a good leader? Well, he was quite successful at certain stages in his life. But what do we mean by good? And so the one group will say goodness has a moral component. 
you also know it's about efficiency, about communication, about all the other elements. Um, in ethics, leadership is about taking wise decisions. And it's more than integrity. We can talk a lot, and we will do that, about authenticity and integrity as a leader. And a lot goes wrong there with greed or uh, sexual lives of leaders, or the many problems are there. But integrity, unfortunately, is not enough. You can be very authentic, very virtuous, and still a fool doing the wrong thing. Good leaders need more than integrity, unfortunately. Uh, they also need integrity, but they have to take wise decisions. And the field of ethics is about is a study of the good as an ultimate reality, but for Bonhoeffer, in the end, it's always a decision of faith. In Bonhoeffer's ethics, you never get to the, to the completeness without any guilt. As a leader, you will have to take decisions that are in such a conflict, or so hard, that there will be suffering involved. And he does like the word compromise, again with this national socialistic background, because a compromise looks as if you did it quite well. If you say, we made a compromise, so we did a good job. Uh, 3,000 people are killed, or losing, or 2,000 people lost their job. Maybe that's more realistic. That was a compromise. Well, it's still, it's still bad. It's still bad. And you're still guilty to a certain extent. And there comes the cross of Christ. So there is this uh, awareness that there is no leadership without having Schult Übernahm, and he calls it, taking guilt in your life and dealing with this guilt, which is very realistic uh, to, to see it that way. Now, the study of ethics is about human relationship, and leadership is a particular type of human relation. Jonas Siula is one of the few excellent philosophers that publishes on the ethics of leadership, and this is very brief, and actually saying why it's relevant. Leadership is a certain type of relationship, and whenever you have a type of relationship among people, there is a moral component. Always. There's a financial component, there's a social, there's a psychological component, but there's also a moral component. Because we're talking about relationships. Uh, the dimensions we can discuss are the, the moral character of the leader. That's one area of study. We can discuss the vision, the values, the program. Uh, some leaders have, for instance, certain economic vision or on climate change, and they have ideas about this, and we can discuss that vision. So, is this a good vision? Is this rightfully so? Um, about e e social justice issues, but also about technology. Or the process, how you come to your goal, can be discussed. The choices you make as a process. There are three areas of studying the moral components of that. There is a tendency to focus only on the character, which I regret, because when people have a wrong vision and are not applying the process well, they are still behaving evil. Uh, but they don't feel guilty, and they think it's only an issue of moral character. The same with leadership, that it is kind of heroism, a tendency like the heroic, the big man theory. The man that will make the difference wherever you put him. Well, that's not the case in leadership studies, not at all. It's a very typical type of relationship. It's an asymmetric relationship. Uh, you have this little cartoon where this guy on the top of the stone says, Believe me, fellows, everyone from the pharaoh on down is an equally valued member of the team. Well, not really, is it? Not really. Asymmetric relationships... And, and that's the, also the, the strange thing about using concepts like servant leadership. 